Hello everyone, this is China Paradigm, where we, Dashi Consulting, interview seasoned entrepreneurs in China. Hello everyone, today I'm with Vincent Gossup. I met with you in Hong Kong at an event for tech startups, and I thought I had to interview this guy, because you're in between China and Middle East. And I've interviewed many people who are in between the US and China, Europe and China, but you, you're in between two parts of the world we rarely talk about and still there's a lot to do. And you're in an industry where China is playing a big game. The game industry, Tencent and many other studios are developing games for the world. That's something I discovered through a research we did for one of our clients. The top one third of the top 100 apps in India are Chinese. Now people are understand how China can be big in apps when we talk about TikTok, Douyin in Chinese. But so far, it has been a bit unknown how China could, how big it could be. So, you have co-founded Falafel Games, co-founded, and maybe we tell, you tell us more about your co-founders later on. You have co-founded Falafel Games in April 2010, and until now, you are still a CEO, so close to 10 years. You are... Um, adapting games, and you are, I'm sure you're going to correct me about what you do exactly, but you are adapting games for Middle East, and you are also at, um, at pushing them, doing the marketing, contributing to the acquisition of this game in Middle East, and further than Middle East, uh, Arab-speaking countries, if I'm, I'm, I'm correct. You have raised money. Uh, you have raised several millions. Uh, my numbers are uh, 4.7 millions uh, so far uh, from very interesting, actually, uh, investors, uh, Irish SME Association, Middle East Venture Partners, and 24454, uh, which is an Abu Dhabi-based incubator. And again, that shows me how, how, how the links between Middle East and China can be. One more number. You are attracting on your different platforms and games more than 2 million users. And in one interview, we found out that you have been able to monetize on average 50 cents, I think it's USD, 50 cents per day per user. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Um, so what do you do exactly? What, what's your business model? Where are your clients? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Mathieu, for having me. And, uh, well, you did a great presentation, introduction, and explaining what I uh, do. Um, so, you know, to answer specifically, the clients of Falafel Games are basically end users, mostly based in, uh, in Arabic-speaking countries, as you mentioned, and half of our revenue comes from uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. Okay. So... When you say that your, your clients are the users, does it mean that you develop your games? It, which, which is not what I understood initially. I understood that you were taking games from China or from wherever the world in the world to adapt them for uh, Arabic-speaking countries. Uh, we, do, we do have this line of business currently. Uh, so basically, we publish games. Okay? We find games that perform well in China. They're just uh, about uh, launched and the KPIs are okay. We approach the developer and we offer them the opportunity to uh, publish, to you know, promote the game in new markets such as Arabic-speaking market and now increasingly Persian-speaking markets. Um, so that's one line of business. We do also develop our own games. Um, in parallel, and we have a live streaming platform also. True, I remember when we met, you insisted on a live streaming platform actually mainly initially. Would you share a bit more about now the size of the company? Uh, I mentioned uh, 4.5 million USD raised so far um, in, as investment and 2 million users. Uh, I don't know if it's daily users or or it's uh, early users. Would you mind sharing a bit more numbers, uh, your offices, size of the team, size of the company, why not? If you can share some revenue numbers um, and um, confirm the numbers I, I just mentioned. Yes, so your numbers are not too far off. Maybe the date since our last discussion. In fact, from the Arabic speaking markets, we have 3 million cumulative users. This is the number of members of users who have installed uh, any one of our 
games. And our games are focused on the mid-core category. So the mid-core category is, generally speaking, uh, very lucrative per capita. But in terms of volume, it's quite niche. So uh, 3 million installs out of like a market of, say, 50 million people in Saudi and the GCC, um, which we specifically focus on as part, you know, as a specific target market in the whole uh, Arabic-speaking market, uh, is, I think, uh, quite an okay penetration. In terms of uh, uh, company size, we have sales of a few millions. We have uh, about uh, 28 people in both places between China and Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, yeah, as you said, we raised four or five million dollars over the course of the years. Um, yeah, generally speaking, I mean, this is the outline of... We have launched uh, six or seven titles so far. So, thank you very much for clarifying the size and, and, um, and what you do. Uh, more precisely in China, you are talking about a niche of games, a niche of apps. What, what's the name of this niche you are targeting? Ah, yeah. So I, I call it, you know, most of us in the industry call it mid-core. So it's between casual and hardcore. And it bas it's basically, you know, try to simplify it with as few parameters as possible. It's basically uh, the time commitment needed by a user to spend on a game and the attention needed to put on a game while playing is more or less what defines, you know, the whole continuum from casual to mid-core to hardcore. So, for example... If Go ahead, yeah, if you, you have, if you have some examples, examples I mean, example. that people can know yeah. with the rest. Yes, of course. Of course, instead of being too abstract with the definitions. So, if you were to spend, for example, both hands on your phone screen on a game, and 100% of your attention over the span of one hour. This is, and a couple of hours every day and over a few months, this is Indeed. a lot of time commitment, especially that your full attention is taken when you're playing the game and both hands are taken. So this is hardcore, okay? This is like really. Uh, uh, but if you were, let's say, to spend one or two hours a day over a few months also, but with much less attention when you use it. Let's say you open the game, you do a couple of turns, you switch to email, nothing happens, you have a discussion, you have a call, you come back to the game, you readjust your situation in the game, and then keep going. Uh, this is, you know, with sessions of, say, 30 seconds, and maybe 30 sessions a day, this is mid-core. Uh, and then casual is like, you know, whatever you can play, uh, pick up in a minute, and then you don't have to commit for days or, or months. On so some examples that everyone knows, Tetris. Tetris would be casual, mid-core, or hardcore? Yeah, Tetris is casual. It's casual. Uh, you can play it for a minute, a session, and you know, you can drop the game for six months. Nothing happens, then you come back, you can still play. What would, what would be a... Hardcore, well-known hardcore. Final Fantasy would be hardcore? Final Fantasy is uh, quite a heavy-duty uh, mid-core game. Uh, hardcore, you need to have your full attention focused on it. So, for example, you know, like the recent uh, Call of Duty does require full attention over 30 minutes. You cannot get distracted while you're playing. Uh, Call of Duty Mobile, released by, by uh, Tencent Studio, basically, is uh, something I would call hardcore. Now, a lot of people in the industry, you know, would defer to me uh, with me. Uh, on how this is defined, but it's, it's, you know, generally speaking, those two defining parameters, you know, time spent per session and attention spent per session is something we all agree on. I see. By listening to what you said before, I feel that I overstated, in fact, the link with China, because I feel actually uh, you, you develop your own uh, your own games or you on the live streaming platform and uh, I'm not seeing the link with China as as uh, obvious as before except that you have an office in Hangzhou well no the uh, well the gaming business is a born global business and uh, uh, our presence in Hangzhou is uh, in China 
and our founding in China. So I founded the company. The company ha had spent six years in China before establishing anywhere else, seven years even. Um, so the presence in China has been essential in a few ways. So, you know, China, you know we have uh, employees in China, we have talent in China, we learn best practices in China. And we do find, I didn't, you know, we do find games and partners who have games in China, which we could promote outside. So, uh, both for the games we developed and for the games we publish and for the... Uh, the talent we need, China is always a part of the uh, of the recipe. I see, I see. So I understand now that China has been the place where you founded it. So that's why actually you are in China. You 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 actually you have a link with China because you were there. You were at at that time I think uh, finishing or studying at SIBS, so the famous MBA uh, based in Shang in uh, in Shanghai and maybe in other in other cities because it should be Europe and China business school. Um, and um, I understand that it's by this circumstance that it it started in China and then you learn from this environment in transformation with digitization is so big and so advanced, which is China, especially Hangzhou. Ah, okay, I, I got it. Well, beyond digitization, there were some very specific trends that uh, uh, may, made it make sense to set up in China. Uh, at that time, freemium, the you know, free-to-play model, uh, was extremely nascent in the West while it was growing and becoming dominant in Asia, Korea, China, for many reasons. Uh, mainly the Koreans uh, started uh, implementing it because of the situation in China where piracy was rampant back then, back when, and uh, because people wouldn't, you know, pay for to buy a, a boxed game, you know, they would want it for free, they were used to free content, back then, back when. Uh, and then China, uh, Chinese companies uh, kind of like perfected this art, way before it was adopted and completely embraced in the West, in the US and Europe. So, at uh, that time, uh, the freemium model, which was emerging in China, made very much sense for the Middle East because it shared a lot of a lot of similarities with the environment in China. Piracy used to be rampant then in the Middle East also. And the internet had just come of age whereby you could actually play a game on the internet. While before you had just a couple of years before that you had to buy it on CDs, you know, as boxed games. So we shared the same attributes in terms of like piracy and in terms of the need for, you know, free content instead of, and no fluency at all with buying paid content, um, and the emergence of an acceptable internet infrastructure. Uh, so it was sort of like, you know, two very similar markets, except that um, uh, the language differed, obviously. Uh, so, you know, beyond just digitization, very specifically in the games business, China was a good reference and model back then. What has changed? What has changed that freemium now um, is um, not the, the mainstream and then you can have premium? What, what has changed that now people can pay, buy? Now you, you are monetizing like 50 cents uh, USD per user on average per day. By the way, it, it seems a huge number for me, but when you multiply by 360 days and by 2 million, it seems huge. So what has changed? No. So, of, uh, you know, just uh, to note, we don't make 50 cents per day per, uh, per you know, the million. Yeah, of I calculate it's like 300 per million. Active user per day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, hopefully soon. But, uh, you know, basically, so if I have like 100 users enter my games today, active today, you know, whether it's their first time or their nth time, uh, I make 40 to 50 cents per user per these users per day. So it's not over the two million. Hopefully soon. We have tens of thousands of users, a few thousands of daily active users, basically. Um, so question being that... So yeah, what has what changed? changed? Yes. Uh, you mean what has changed from premium to freemium or freemium being uh, bashed 
these days and turning back to premium. What, what, you said that sim similarities were between China and Middle East that freemium and people, the willingness for people to pay was low. And that freemium then became ma mainstream and it had to be freemium if you wanted people to use the games and people want to use the games. But now it, it turns out that in China, and I don't know if it's in the Middle East, you know it, but in China, people pay for games. People for pay a lot of things to is speaking, to be VIP client of QQ email. QQ email, just because you have a bigger box, you pay for that in China. Uh, so they accept to send small money to KOL, uh, the famous Hongbao. So what has changed in China and in the Middle East, if the similarities continue to be built, uh, what has changed that now you can ask them to pay uh, yeah, play. so uh, first of all, there's a disconnect in this behavior these days between the China and the Middle East. China, Chinese users have become much more willing to pay outright for content. While this hasn't happened yet in the Middle East, they're still, they still expect free content and try to, you know, do their best to, like, go around to get free content. But, of course, you can monetize them well uh, in different ways. So, but what has changed, I think, you know, so this is, Certainly, China has, uh, you know, has gone very fast through this transformation of going from we want all the content free to we are happy to pay, and even at rates much higher in some cases and in some categories than the West, paying outright for content. Uh, just thinking of it, you know, generally speaking, I don't think much has changed. I just think the natural... Uh, evolution of things is taking place. So when you think about it, okay, uh, if I want to go out, you know, with my friends today and watch a movie, let's say we're going to spend, I don't know, per, per person 100, 200 kwai, uh, and basically we're watching a movie and spending time together. While increasingly we are spending time together online, separate physically, but spending time online, and we can get that same movie for two kwai or for a 20 kwai subscription or 30 kwai VIP subscription on, on some video on demand platform or something. So uh, online entertainment, same thing for games, you know. Uh, if we were to go out, I don't know, to a bar or play tennis or something, we're going to spend a couple hundred kwais also. While we might spend two, three kwais on average per hour if we're like having fun online. So it's just normal, you know, entertainment still is, uh, online entertainment, still is by far, by far, by far, the cheapest form of entertainment on a per hour basis. Um, so one thing that really changed and made people realize that, oh, it is actually quite uh, cheap to have fun online, is uh, maybe the uh, increased penetration of, uh, of payment systems such as WeChat and Alipay. So they're used to buying, the, we're used now to buying the noodles, the, uh, you know, ordering online, and transferring money, all with our phones. So it's really one click away that um, it completely removed the friction from seeing, let's say, a movie online for two kwai or for a 20, 30 kwai subscription and paying for it. Uh, but that pricing had always made sense. In fact, I think if you look at how much disposable income goes online, it's still a tiny portion. I, sh I think we're still early on. We're st we can still spend much more online than we are today. So what people pay then? We know that they moved, James speaking, the users moved from freemium to a little bit of premium, 50 cents per day when they, they are active, as you said, on average. What do they pay for? Okay, so the well, it's uh, a bit less than fifty cents in our case, and in our case, it's still the freemium model. So when I tell you it's uh, forty, fifty cents, it's the average. So if I take today's revenue and divide it by the daily active users, it's forty, fifty cents. But only one percent of users of these users paid, and they subsidize the remaining the remaining ninety nine. So it's still the freemium. So usually, what they pay, you have kind of like. In our case, you know, let's, I mean, online you can pay for a lot of things. You mentioned the tipping, the hombao, you outright content, subscriptions, games, premium games, and items inside of games. So specifically for items inside of games, uh, such as is our case, um, basically you can categorize them in three categories. What 
payers pay for. First of all is utilities. Utilities is, for example, you know, making my experience of the game easier. Let's say you want to send uh, two coins or one unit of stamina to all of your friends in the game. Uh, with one button, you can send it to all of them, and that's going to cost you a few gems, and the gems convert to dollars, or bought with dollars or with RMB. Um Instead of, like, sending to all of them one by one, it just makes the experience smoother. We remove the ads if you, like, pay a small amount, okay? Utilities. Second category is cosmetics. You just you're cosmetic. You just want to make your avatar look nicer. You want to add skins. You want to make your gun brighter. Uh, you want to have a crown on top of your icon. Things like that that don't uh, perform uh, in the game experience, but just look better. And when you spend enough time on the game, you might want to say, "Ah, oh, it's time for me to you know put my signature on the game." The third uh, category is the performance items. So, for example, sometimes in strategy games or role play, you mentioned Final Fantasy in games uh, similar to Final Fantasy, you need to upgrade your heroes and find items for your heroes and upgrade the items and go to battle and you have very few stamina points for the battles. So, for all of these, for the waiting, you can accelerate. For the finding, you can increase the rate, the chance of finding. For the battle, you can, you know, battle more by getting stamina. So all of these additional more weight, less waiting, uh, more chance of fighting, more battle, all these uh, bonuses are paid for with gems. Now, generally speaking, the, uh, it varies with the markets, but in our case, most by the crushing uh, uh, fraction is the, uh, is the performance. So, you know, people just want to perform better in the game. And we can discuss a little bit of the psychology behind that. Uh, cosmetic is uh, and utilities are tiny, a couple percentage points of the overall spending of gems. Um, now, why do people want to perform so well? You know, you have different uh, kinds of gamers. You have the gamers who play on their own. They just want to feel uh, they're achieving. What is that uh, Olympic uh, slogan? Higher, further, stronger or something like that. Uh, so, you know, they're happy with uh, beating themselves time after time, so they might want to, like, improve their performance from time, from time to time. You have the killers, you know, those who really want to compete, and, you know, they want to perform better than others. So you have leaderboards for them to compare, uh, uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, direct the confrontations. Uh, between them, so, you know, someone wins and someone loses. You have the socializers, those who just want to spend their time, you know, lubricating the system and doing alliances and uh, uh, chatting and messaging each other. You have the explorer, those who just are just curious about finding out more and more hidden corners of the game. Generally speaking, the killers are the most lucrative. Uh, in the performance. Uh, that's at least in our category of games. Now, you would say, we have killers, you know, who pay thousands of dollars a month. Now, you can say, why do these people spend so much, you know? And I can make the case why this is actually, first, a very small proportion of their disposable income. Second, a very uh, a much cheaper than all of their other entertainment options, but most importantly, what you do when you're a living killer is you're basically uh, showing status, okay, getting a certain buff of psychological satisfaction by being the leader, by being the number one, and here I can discuss, I can, you know, uh, showcase a few situations why this is still taking place outside of games, and it's much healthier inside of games. So, outside of games, you know, you can go to, uh, like, you know, the, the hottest mall in, uh, in Beijing and uh, check the cars parked by the gate, okay? So these cars, what are they? You know, they're like the most luxurious cars in the country. And 
they're parked there at the front of the... Why are they parked at the front of the gate? You know, why are they parked in like the ninth floor on the ground? They're parked right at the gate for two hours. Because it's uh, to a very large degree one utility, but most importantly a symbol, a status symbol. Uh, and that car was expensive compared to the status symbol you can get inside of a game, especially that only a few hundred thousand people are going to walk in and out of that mall and see the car, while tens of thousands are going to see you for over an extended period of time inside of an online game. So basically, I'm selling you the, psycho the, um, the psychological buff, that satisfaction, without selling you the metal and the wheels and the alloys and I don't know what, and the, all the pollution that goes along with it. Uh, basically, it also goes down to the question of what are you buying when you buy a pair of jeans? Why was your pair of jeans more than a thousand kwai? Tell me, what's the reason? Why wasn't it 50 kwai? Why that premium? That premium is basically a buff of, of emotional satisfaction. Okay? So I'm selling you that buff without uh, selling you the denim. And for a much more extended period of time. So it completely makes sense. If you're willing to buy a thousand koi pair of jeans, it completely makes sense to spend 500 koi on a much better uh, level of satisfaction inside of an online game. In fact, let me go even further. There were imperial colonial wars waged on colonies. Let's say... Holland in Indonesia or France and other places, just so that in a person in Paris drinks a cup of coffee and mm, gets that satisfaction. That cup of coffee, let's say, was sold for five francs in some Parisian cafe, and maybe the ton was bought for five francs from the colony. So there was, you know, uh, I'm, the coffee the cafe, the coffee shop, was not selling coffee beans. The coffee shop was selling that buff of emotional satisfaction. Interesting. And, and so whole, basically, yeah. what you're saying is that the, the, one of, part of the psychology for paying is the social status. Uh, you believe that they, they, people want to compare to others, be the first, compete, as a, the, the, killer, the killer psychology, as you said, to, to be above uh, all the others. We moved a bit further in, in actually uh, your core business and how, it, and how people convert from freemium to premium. Actually, before that, I wanted to talk about the beginnings of uh, Falafel Games in China. I believe Shanghai, Hangzhou, because you have been uh, studying in Shanghai at SIPS and you have your office in Hangzhou. Uh, could you tell us more about how you started with whom? Why games? Um, do you, are you a developer yourself? Uh, why, wh why did you start this business? Uh, how? With which money? With whom? A bit of understanding of how it started for people to get a better sense of wh 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 what the start was. Mm. Well, uh, long story, you know, I, I think uh, I start, I, I like to say I started it when I was three years old, ever since I could hold a controller. Because from whenever I was three years old until I started the company after my MBA graduation, there had always been a very obvious uh, lacuna in the Middle East market, and it was there's not many games with authentic Arabic content. And that was not like, oh, such a discovery. It was so obvious. Uh, turns out when I was doing my MBA in, uh, in uh, Thebes, China Europe International Business School in Shanghai, it was the time when the trend we just discussed about, uh, you know, the growth of freemium model and the uh, uh, maturity of the internet infrastructure was taking place. And I had a few classmates also who had been in the game industry. And, I, you know, it just clicked in my mind, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, now you can make a game that does not need to be pirated, that is free and that can still make money in areas where internet is just coming out of age uh, and solving the problem of lack of content. It just made perfect sense. Now, um, it's, it's really a no-brainer. It's not, you know, it's very simple. Um, 
very simple proposition. I feel, and people, uh, and because people it, may not know, yeah. sorry, I feel that, I, I take myself as an example, when I was, I'm, I'm French, I grew in France, uh, in a very French family, French environment, I didn't know what I didn't have. If, if suddenly some some uh, movies were not uh, translated in French or games were translated in French, only I, I would just not know them. But I believe that your ability to assess that there were more games uh, which were in, in English which were not in Arabic language, I think it's because you have been educated in a very international environment. Because when I go on your on your LinkedIn, I see that you have been at the American University of Beirut, you have been in Toronto, and you have been at SIPS after. So from, from the very beginning, you had an international mindset in order to be able to compare with other countries, other, or, or, or other behavior and so on. Am I correct with that? Uh, well... Now you're asking me to come out of my shell and look at it and analyze. Maybe, maybe. But um, I don't think it's so extreme, really. I think, you know, the realization and the articulation of the opportunity, um, I wouldn't, you know, attribute it so much to, let's say, my uh, experience in living in many places and international outlook. Uh, I, I just used to play games. Okay. You know, so imagine you loved watching uh, movies and when you were a kid in France and all the movies were in English. Mm. Let's say that was the case. I know that this was not the case, but let's say that was the case. Then you can, you know, you don't need to be like uh, Marco Polo to realize that, oh, it would be nice to have a movie in French, right? To have it at least translated to French, dubbed. Uh, so that was my trigger. You know, it wasn't like, oh, so much international outlaw. Oh, I used to play games and they were in English. What can I do? Um, and you don't, you don't need a lot of language to be able to play the game. But the actual lacuna I noticed is content, not language. So not just a matter of translating, you know, the shape of the heroes, the story, the narratives, all of that. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one, but I think the international, that's in terms of like articulating the opportunity, but I think in terms of execution, this is where the international outlook, I think, really helped me mm. out. Uh, so, you know, just in terms of context, I had, uh, I also lived in France during the Lebanese Civil War for a couple of years, when, you know, during my childhood, and in North America in uh, the Middle East, in Lebanon, and in Iraq, and in China. So that's like three or four continents, four or five countries. Um, and it just made things easier, you know, easier. It, I didn't see the barriers, let's mm, say, I see. of like doing cross-border business, yes. of like negotiating with my first Chinese partner. I, for me, it was just like some dude, you know, He's a guy, yeah, and you know, there's a lot of them all over the world. It's not that I didn't see a big uh, uh, barrier in doing that. And, you know, the travel needed, the cross-language communication required, all of that, maybe uh, my international outlook made me reckless, gave me a reckless attitude toward it, which in a way can be good as long as it's not too, too reckless. So as far as I understand, you had understanding, uh, uh, sorry, not an understanding, but also a passion for games. And it was obvious for you that you would do something in games. I mean, there's uh, um, basically um, an attraction to games. And you were in China studying at SIEB. And because you were in China, studying in China. And because also it was for you a laboratory to see what was happening, digitally speaking, with games. Maybe Korea as well was a laboratory for you. Um, and you started there to get inspired, to learn the best practices, and so on. It's a bit counterintuitive for me, mm -hmm. because what I get from most people in development and, and online uh, businesses is that China is mm -hmm. expensive. China is not a place where mm -hmm. actually developers are cheap. It's not a place where you can find developers easily. Mm -hmm. It's not a place where they can develop for the world, because it's very China-centric compared to India, for instance. So that's why, for me, it was a bit contrarian. How do you react to that? Yeah. Yeah, I always get that. So why are you in China? Is it because of cost? It's absolutely not, not the case, cost. right? Costs are very high. Yes, of course. There's a lot of competition from most multinationals, from a lot of software companies to get the talent. And despite the big volume of talent supply, 
In fact, if you divide it by the number of companies competing on that talent supply, it's quite competitive and it like just jacks up the prices, the, the salaries, basically. Um, but there's a lot of uh, reactions. Uh, uh, there's a lot of justifications for that. First of all, is the best practices developed. So China is a bloodbath in terms of gaming market and it's lead in, in terms of competition. And Would you mind sharing? And it's lead, it has led. Now, some examples, some yeah. present examples about the best practices. What best practices have you learned from China? Oh, just doing good game design, you know. So if you look around the whole world, teams that could do good game design develop a, ga develop a game efficiently. There's very, 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 very few places. And China is one of them where supply is at least big enough, large enough. Uh, and if you compete, if you are able to acquire it, you know, you can... You can come up with something. So let me get, uh, boil it down to you to a very simple equation. You want to make a, a game in China. Uh, you want to make games in China. Okay? So let's say it, you have a certain cost, I don't know, a million dollars, okay, to make the game. Um, so your cost per game is one million divided by one. You spend a million dollars to make a game. If you make it elsewhere, it might cost you 500,000. But you're not sure you're going to get a game. So it's 500,000 divided by zero. You end up with zero games. And it's, it's practically infinite cost. So it might be per, you know, per resource, per human resource, che cheaper elsewhere. But per game, you might end up with no games. Uh, I'm not saying there's only China that can deliver that. Of course, there's other places that are still much more expensive than China, Northern Europe, uh, the US, Canada, that can deliver good quality games and even you know developing countries not like it's the it's the monopoly of advanced places um, uh, but you know the idea here is that you need to get a good game so that you mm. can compete mm. and then you stop asking about the cost of your human resource especially that your cost of human resource is practically not cost of goods sold it's not like I'm buying you know I'm buying cheap and selling slightly with a marker in games I have a fixed cost, you know, if you look, think of like the cost structure. The development team is a fixed cost. You have to pay the salaries every month. And then the revenue is variable, so it's very high operational leverage. The revenue can grow ad infinitum, in theory, okay, infinitely, uh, can grow infinitely in theory without much yeah. growth in your fixed cost of That's the development. That's the beauty of, of, of... I'm not mentioning here the variable cost of the marketing. Yeah, that, that, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're in a situation like this, and if you're chasing the, the, the utopia whereby you get high revenue compared to uh, the fixed cost, then you will accept to have a fixed cost that's still okay, relatively high, because the revenue is so much higher. And if you try to save a little bit on your fixed cost, you know, let's say bring it down by 20-30%, you might be killing the chances of the game of making of even breaking even on your fixed cost. So we understand that so, there is an uh, investment. You know, Initially, you you need to invest for a period of time to develop the game. Yes. How did you invest? Was it your own money? Did you raise money from the very beginning? A bit of everything. So um, early on, uh, well, we had just discussed about the proposition. The proposition is quite um, so. It's quite simple. And if you look at the Middle East market, generally speaking, 400 million people, uh, homogeneous language, uh, quasi-homogeneous religion, a lot of common cultural norms, co uh, young population, uh, uh, well-connected. So it's a good, you know, it's a good opportunity. And so initially... I put in some of my money. I was able to convince a couple of friends to put in a little bit of money. And most importantly, I was able to, I found like a whole team, you know, uh, to make, because in games you need multiple skills to make a what game. What skills do you art, need? You know, the engineering. Well, yeah, the art, the engineering, and the game design, and the management to glue them, glue them all together. And then, of course, a, a few sub-skills within these. And you need them all, you know, you cannot have one mm. uh, link missing. Design as well. So I was lucky to find... Uh, uh, yes, design, mm. game design. So I was lucky to find a, uh, a game development company based out of Hangzhou called Tianzhuo, which uh, agreed to partner up uh, 
with us for equity uh, to go after the opportunity and uh, put in their own team. Wow. And I had the option to bring that team uh, in-house and I, 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 I did uh, exercise it. Actually. Impressive. I the team after I addressed. So, mm, so I don't remember, I don't have the, the exact numbers in my mind. We needed a few hundred thousand dollars to come up with that first game and we only had tens, maybe a couple hundred thousand in cash commitments early on, but along with the team that was working on it for equity, we were doing progress, and this allowed us to raise uh, our first institutional round on the go. As we so went. how much time to develop the first game? Do you talk about two months, three months, six months? No, 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 a lot of time. It was, uh, so uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, our category of games has a very uh, variable uh, production cost. In our case, it's about 15 people over 15 months. 50 people, uh, 15 months, I see. So, yeah, so 225 man months, okay. Uh, uh, but you have uh, similar games in the same category uh, that might cost tens of millions of dollars. Uh, 10, 20, 30 million sometimes. Uh, just because it's so easy to, you know, uh, spend uh, bottomless, uh, bottomless uh, pits of money on... Uh, let's say, perfect art and more art and, you know, more stages. And you always have the, a critical decision of when you should launch and start harvest, start collecting money. Uh, when you're at 50%, when you're at 99%, when you're at 150% of, you know, the development progress in the game. It's something that uh, uh, affects, you know, the, your your upfront investment. Um, but generally speaking, now more and more, the upfront investment in developing a game, whether a few hundred thousand dollars like our case or a few million dollars like many cases or even tens of millions in very few cases, um, is generally not the main upfront investment. The main upfront investment eventually turns out to be the user acquisition spend. But this is like less of an investment than a viable cost because you should be you should cover your cost after the acquisition, right? Yes, yes. So I mean, also depending on policies because it's so variable. You know, you can spend a hundred dollars on user acquisition per day, or you can spend uh, ten thousand mm. dollars per day, or you can spend millions mm. per day, and uh, it's extremely variable. Essentially, it boils down not only to that, but you know, an easy parameter is cost per install. So you put your target installs, and then yeah. you know your budget needed per day. Uh, and that can be extremely highly variable. So, uh, but still, because let's say you have a policy of like 90 days payback on your ROI, on your ad spend. So you have this initial uh, trough that you have to go through and you need the cash balance for it. Some companies go for 360 day payback. So basically the idea is if I spend $100 on Facebook ads, let's say today, from the cohort of users that gets acquired from this hundred dollars, how long do I need to earn back the hand, the hundred dollars? Um, so I need to, I, I keep optimizing my uh, my targeting and my budget allocations until I meet a certain payback um, target. So if my payback target is ninety days, you know, it, depending on the game, the game quality, the uh, advertising quality, I might reach high volume of players or low volume of players. So, but the longer my payback uh, target period target is, let's say, and I know some companies who have 440 days payback period target, then your, you know, your cash balance needed to sustain all that trough, that valley is huge. I think one of the questions that many people who are listening to us and I have myself is how were you able to connect with this Chinese company? to convince this Chinese company to work with you and uh, to actually work well with the Chinese company uh, when you are just an MBA student or you just got out of the MBA. Um, I think those three items, so how did you find, how did you convince and how do you work with them are, are kind of a mystery for us right now. <laughs> it's kind of a mystery to me too. Uh, the secret word here in my case and how I found this was Guanxi. I'm sure you have like... Sure. 50 podcasts where you discuss Guanxi, 
so you know, a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend, and then it's a chain of favors, and then you know things get done. Um, I was very lucky that you know my MBA gave me sort of like a soft landing in China, and I was able to build a small network of uh, like you know well-connected business people in China who could eventually. But you have to push through, you know, the first layer of your guanxi is never the one that gets you the piñata, the jackpot. Then you have to ask one person for the next, build trust, then they ask the next for the following, build trust. And you don't know in which branch of your guanxi network eventually you can get the, the, you know, the click where there's a good synergy for good business. So I had a friend, basically. I have one of my alumni who... Uh, who was into gaming too, and, you know, we were going around and, you know, looking at opportunities in games, going to conferences, and then he remembered that he had that friend who has a development company who does things that I might be interested in, and then we discussed them. Uh, he was interested in my market and my proposition, and he agreed to, like, put in his team. And the nice thing in games, in software in general, is that you could, to some large degree, build one cell infinitely many times. So from the perspective of our first you know, development partner uh, who entered for equity, they could build our game skinned for us once and reskin it infinitely many times for other markets. And that was their idea. So they had actually a reskin of our very game, game in the Chinese market. I see. Uh, for themselves. So, you know... Let's say, I don't know, let's say his investment, in term, if you count in man months, let's say it was 500k, okay? But that 500k all went, also went to his own game. I see, I see. So the marginal cost he had for us was not so much, it was like, uh, tens of thousands. So uh, that's how we found. How we worked was much more difficult. And I think luck was like a big factor because uh, I think luck and perseverance, really. Uh, I had, so I moved, I completely moved to Hangzhou. I stayed on top of it. I knew we were not going to understand each other. They barely spoke English. We barely spoke Chinese. And I had, so our proposition was bringing Arabs with Chinese together. I can barely work with Arabs. I can barely work with Chinese. Now I have to work with both and let them work together, you know? Uh, so it needed a lot of perseverance, I think. And the, one of like the mottos I had is, Whatever the problem is, consider it a cultural gap problem first. First, you know, say clean, clean, the, put that off the table. Like, you know, sometimes it's a coordination, sometimes it's bad code, sometimes it's implementation not as per requirements. Some, whatever it is, you know, I. I, d I didn't start like this, but I got to the point where, like, okay, whatever this problem is, let's see, is it a cultural communication? Is it, should we just sit and cross the bridge, or the cultural bridge, okay, and put it out of the way? And then if I make sure, you know, all the possible cultural gaps are not there, then it's a normal professional problem that you handle normally professionally. But guess what? Most of the problems were of that first category. I see. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. When did you raise your first fund uh, from institutional investors? I mean, I understand it was from a partner first and then from institutional investors. Actually, I'm surprised with yes. the, the investor you have. You have the ISME. I didn't know about them. Irish SME Association. I didn't know they would invest in, right? And then you have the Middle East Venture Partners. I understand better because it's linked with Middle East here. And then the Abu Dhabi based in Kibera. Mm. We, might be, we might be mistaking the ISMEs we're mentioning here. So... The ISME that uh, uh, invested in me is basically a Lebanese financial entity, which is a joint venture between a large uh, loan insurance company in Lebanon and the World Bank, half-half. I see. So it's not Irish at all. So my, my team wrote wrong, right? Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it seems it's the same name. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> if you Google it, you might okay. end up with the same all day. In fact, okay. yeah, in fact, it's a very, it's, uh, so we, maybe I shouldn't say SME, maybe I should just say Kafalat, which is the name of the loan insurance company, uh, because ISME is almost like an internal name for them. It's that small initiative, it's just a small fund of, I don't know, maybe 25 or 50 million dollars, something like that, which they put half and the World Bank put half and it's for like equity investment. In fact, it's for equity matching. They don't invest. They don't lead. They match. 
Uh, and in that ca in my case, they matched the um, EVP, Middle East Venture Partners, which is my lead investor on a couple of rounds, two rounds, basically. When did you uh, raise? One, round one year after? Yeah, uh, yeah, about one year after. So I got first uh, raised by MEVP was uh, uh, basically, basically, you know, I never had like finite, uh, you know, like they say in the stories and when you listen to podcasts, I got a seed round, a series A, a series B, very finite, open the round, close the round, maybe because I'm in a market with very little uh, equity financing liquidity. Uh, so it's a, like an ongoing thing with me, you know, uh, my round is always open, my valuation is always going up and down, and it's much less, those windows are not so well defined. So uh, to, to tell you how it went, you know, this uh, kind of like flexible ongoing thing, I got a $100,000 convertible loan by MVP first, and they had three conditions to enter with their follow-up equity round for of I think it was five or six hundred thousand dollars one of them was getting a co-investor two of them were operational one of them was getting a co-investor uh, and I was really really lucky that the game we were working on then uh, kind of like uh, uh, met the uh, branding okay. of a TV series that uh, NBC oh, okay. which is a TV yeah uh, Middle East Broadcasting Corporation was working on. So they accepted to join that round and I cleared that condition and I cleared the other two conditions. So they entered with a, um, <clears throat> with an equity round then of, uh, 800 me, yeah, more or less, you know, the numbers, yes, 800, including the convertible and they converted the, their, uh, convertible note to, to equity with a discount. Uh, yeah, and then the, following round was also led by MEVP and followed by 2454 and ISME. Did you raise money because you were not profitable or did you raise money to go faster and to, to develop uh, new markets? Both. Okay. Are you it profitable went hand in hand. So, uh, we are if we want to. So our we are okay. investing heavily in I our see. live streaming and it's eating from profits and from capital. I in see. our live streaming business. Yes. I see. We have not talked enough about live streaming and it's still already one hour we're talking. So um, I'd like to take five minutes to talk about the live streaming, which actually seems to be the masterpiece of, 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 of Falafel Games. I mean, to be, to, 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 I feel that's the cornerstone of it. Could you tell us more about what it is, how you monetize, how important it is, um, and uh, how it come from? Yes, of course. So um, uh, today, the interactive live video multiplayer platform called Techie is uh, indeed the masterpiece of our strategy moving forward. And in fact, it's uh, it's even a separate kind of like department and even a subset subsidiary, subsidiary in the whole uh, uh, group, Falafel group, let's say. So we have the game part and the live streaming part and uh, set up in two separate legal entities. But it wasn't designed that way at the beginning. At the beginning, it started as a simple product to solve two challenge, to solve one challenge we had in the game, in the game part, which was that the cost per install CPIs were rising dramatically, significantly fast, and ROIs were thinning. And uh, so we were thinking, okay, where is this going, and what is an approach we can do so that we dramatically reduce our CPI? And we found a nice category of games with experimentation and after the experimentation we realized it's how nice it is and we were able to articulate it. It's basically games which if not in Arabic cannot be played by Arabic users such as word games, quiz games, you know, so a, a, a competitor from you know, the, let's say the US can come with the best quiz game in the world if it's not good Arabic content my crappy game and you know in comparison will do better. And People will want to, will not only will do better, people will want to install my, because it's a content play, you know, it's basically the difference between necessary local content and nice to have local content. Consider yourself a user and going through a journey and I tell you, come play this tank game, tank battle game, okay? Whether it's in English or Arabic or French, it's not going to make a big difference for you. The language is nice to have. But if it's a quiz game or a word game or cross, crossword game, whatever, no, it's a must. 
Okay, so but we we put put out a crossword game, which was a really really cool game by the way, uh, and it just sucked traffic like crazy. And uh, uh, in fact, I don't count this traffic as part of the official KPIs I gave you early on because it was more of an experiment and outside of our core back then. Uh, but to give you a comparison, uh, when we launch a mid-core game. Uh, let's say a strategy RPG game, our cost per install is two to seven dollars, depending on the channel, depending on the quality. It averages at about four dollars, a bit less than four, three and a half dollars. Okay. Uh, when we launched that uh, crossword game, which is must have Arabic, so very little competi competition in that category, and although. Uh, in general, Arabic-speaking people don't like too much, uh, you know, reading, uh, reading games, games that involve text. Uh, with thirteen thousand dollars, we were able to get five hundred thousand installs. Make the comparison. Yes, in terms of by CPI, it's a very big. I don't know, is it like three cents CPI or something like that? Uh, so it's a very big difference. And we concluded that the reason was that this game is a must-have, must be in Arabic, you know. It doesn't have much competition. Uh, and then we stumbled upon a second problem. We thought, okay, let's go after this category. But then we stumbled upon a second problem, is that text medium doesn't monetize as good as you know, strategy games, role-playing games, a quiz, a quiz game. So the lifetime value of your user it's very low. Then you go back to the problem of low ROI. In the case of Midcore, it's high cost to acquire and high uh, lifetime value per user with a thin margin. In the case of Quiz, it's low CPI, but also low LTV with a thin margin. So what are we doing? Hmm? And so now we set out to like bring up the LTV. And we thought, okay, let's move from the Quiz medium, from the text medium, to the live video medium have real hosts who present the game and in a way it's much more engaging so basically it turns out like a who will be the millionaire game kind of you know but uh, whereby instead of having one participants everybody is competing at the same time on a leaderboard everybody's talking chatting interacting between each other and especially between themselves as an audience and the host who is streaming live and you know the ltv was uh, slightly better, so we found good, good chance here. High LTV, low CPI. We can go after this, and it solved in a way another problem which we had in the game industry, which was the sunrise sunset uh, uh, reality. You know, every game, you know, you have to launch it. It lives. You harvest for a while, and then it sunsets. Then you have to go again with new games or every master or you know revive the game somehow so always up and downs but the live video content is basically kind of like youtube you know you always have live you always have new content that you can put out there so we're hoping and it's starting to prove that it's much more sustainable it grows slower but on a lot of time yes live streaming live video i mean mm. facebook as you mentioned is doing it well where, where how do you differentiate yourself from them for instance you said Facebook? Yeah. Ah, yes. So, of course, there's Facebook, there's YouTube, there is uh, Twitch, even. Uh, but our proposition is basically mostly interactive live video with a lot of different ways to interact. And basically, the you know, you can... So all the call in, message in, uh, and interact with the game. So, you know, we have games set up on top of overlay, on top of our uh, live video feed, where a host or an any influencer mm, can come and set up. So now we have uh, quiz games, variations on quiz games. We have roulette games, whereby the host is practic practically the dealer in a social casino setting, so no cash out. And we're releasing, I guess, what's in the box game. So it basically, it's a lot of... Uh, the Kind of like the, the video feed technology is the same, but we have a lot of like gamification on top, which I don't think uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube even want to do. You know, it's not their DNA. So we're a separate, completely separate DNA from uh, uh, what they're doing. And we're geared towards maximizing revenue for hosts and influencers. So basically our product roadmap is going to the influencers, going to the uh, 
hosts and telling them, what do you want now that can help you make more engagement and more money and we just do it for you. I see. Does it, do I understand, do I, do I understand well if I say that Dream Live Streaming, for instance, you will have someone playing with cards with an audience of people watching and they may ask people, some people to pay if they want to interact in the game with him. Would it be this kind of, 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 of live streaming? Uh, almost. So it's not only cards, it's not only live social casino. Yeah. It can Just be an example. Social yeah. casino. Yes. But so any interaction, participation uh, will, in, will include uh, some spending of uh, virtual items of credits, credits in the game. So if you win, you earn credits. If you lose, you lose credits. You, if you like the game enough, you reach to a point where you run out of credits and then you want to top up. We just give you enough credits. Yeah. Hmm. What's the closest version in China to what you do, or what's the closest version in the US? Mm, yes. So there's a few attempts, you know, in China and in the US to like crack this uh, uh, this system, which is basically the interaction of traditional media and, and interactive games. Uh, some went well, then crashed. Some are going well, and I'll name you a few. And some are exploring. So I'll name you a few, you know. Uh, The most famous one in the U.S. was HQ Trivia, and it had a couple of clones in China, Chongqing Dahui, one of them, by one uh, Sotong, uh, where, you know, it's one or two sessions, 15-minute sessions per day, and there's a cash payout at the end. So it went really, well, it became really popular because of, you know, the cash payout, the cash prize. But then it went down when people realized that they were not able to win so much because so many people were joining. Uh, and for a lot of regulatory reasons, this was stopped in China. You have <coughs> other kind of live stream, which I kind of call, you know, I allow myself to call them soft sex scams. So it's basically Facebook Live, you know, but with tipping and gifting. Uh, but most of the monetization comes from quasi-nudity, uh, or at least flirting with, uh, you know, users flirting with the host. And, Do you have this and issue? It's very big. In hmm? Do you have this issue? How, how do you tackle this issue with your own platform? Uh, yes. So let me go to the third category, then I tell you yeah. how I tackle go this ahead. issue. Um, um, another one is obviously live casino. So casino, the real money, gambling. Okay, they do it and they're doing it well, and it's probably their fastest growing category. Um, and you have the h horde of people exploring it, to which we belong. And some others belong as like a company in the U.S. called Joyride, one called Telly. So uh, basically the reincarnation of live game shows on mobile in a much more interactive way, whereby the interaction is no longer message in or call in or rate or poll or vote. You know, we have all sorts of uh, possible interaction that you can do through the mobile. Now, how did we tackle the issue of uh, sex scam business when we started our own techie? Uh, in fact, we did have uh, a, a host uh, monetizing crazy amounts per hour of broadcast. And we had to figure out why. And eventually, you know, it was sort of like she was like pushing uh, a flirting behavior from the users. And, you know, they were in, she was incentivizing them to uh, send her a lot of gifts. So she was using us as an appointment uh, platform and as a payment gateway, basically. You know, because the gifts are paid, so they send the virtual gifts, the virtual gifts, right, in, on the platform. Basically, the tips to Hombao that you mentioned early on. Uh, and then you give her a revenue share on the back end. Uh, now, you mentioned it's an issue. For a lot of companies, it's the core business. And, it, you know, look at the numbers. The numbers are not so bad. So yeah, many of these companies are, you know, in China are listed. Some of them listed in the U.S. running this... Uh, as a core monetization uh, scheme for them and making billions a year. Uh, uh, we, okay, so putting aside the ethical issue, we didn't even consider it for, an, for ethical reasons, you know. Luckily, we did not have that, uh, to, we did not have to confront that dilemma. Uh, we did it for, at least for business reasons, we thought it wasn't uh, sound for us to do so. We were at the same time finding in one room, like housewives who wanted to play and, uh, you know, 
males who just wanted to flirt with the host, and these could not cohabitate. So basically, we just removed all incentive to the host to, to redeem uh, revenue shares from uh, gifts, and uh, we focused the whole experience on the gaming part. So you come, you know, you play the game. It's not, you don't, you don't uh, just do social interaction forever without playing the game. You must play the game. I see. But you the know, game is designed by you. Yeah, the game is designed by you or just someone mm-hmm. live streaming a game? It's designed by us. So it's a functional overlay on top of the live video. Maybe oh, that in the future, but uh, not very soon. We could allow other people to put up, uh, we could open up an API for other people to put their functional overlay on top of the live video. But today it's too early. So we're just coming up with our own uh, functional over, uh, overlays on top of the live video feed, which represent different kind of games. I see. Thank you very much for your time. It's already more than one hour. Uh, actually, I had more questions. Maybe we could have one session only on the live streaming part. Uh, but it was very, very interesting, very instructive on how you partner with a, a Chinese company. Uh, we invested in you at a very early stage. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. I, I, I can tell you I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much, Mathieu. I enjoyed too. And thanks again. Thank you.